My name is Gary Mack. I'm the Sixth Floor Museum's curator, and this gentleman, Dick Stolle, has been a good friend of the museum now for, golly, 10, 15 years, and, and uh, we email back and forth and correspond because there are always new questions about the Kennedy assassination, and we both have some. You've told this story so many times, and yet it's fascinating every single time. His to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> what? In all these years since, as your story has become better known, what have fellow journalists said to you about this entire adventure and how you got the film? What kind of comments do they toss at you? Well, some of them are still mad, it's true. <laughs> um, there is also a feeling that this was checkbook journalism, that life had deep pockets, and that we uh, we got that film um, because uh, we paid for it. Now, what I, I tried to make clear that that the uh, Abe Spruder could have gotten more money from some of those people out in the hall, and um, and I think it was the uh, I think if journalists are f are fair about it and journalists not always are, um, that, that they realized that this was a kind of a, a classic lesson in, in how a reporter should conduct himself and herself under extremely awful conditions. Um, and I said I started in journalism at age of 17. Actually, I was only 15 when I started. Uh, but I think anyone who's in this business we knew other people who would have conducted themselves very much the same way um, that I did. I also have known other people who would have screwed it up, who would have gone out and banged on the door and, and, and Zapruder was the last thing, person in the world that he wanted to cooperate with. It says something about American journalism, and, um, uh, and, I, and I've known plenty of people who would have conducted themselves exactly as I did and would have gotten that film, uh, I was just lucky enough to be at the right place at the wrong time. You spent more than 50 years with Time Incorporated. One of your great achievements was, one of, was being one of the co-founders of People Magazine. And I'd love to spend all afternoon with this man, and I'm sure you would too, but I think we should probably focus on this event here. Did you have further contact with Abraham Zepruder after that weekend was over? I never saw him again. I, I spoke to him a couple of times. Uh, another part of the, of the deal we made with him was that uh, on Monday, I, I went back and got all rights, that is, film rights, and, and paid him another $100,000 then. Um, so the total was $150,000 for all rights. Um, once we sold still pictures overseas, we did not sell them to any American com competing magazines, and we never sold the motion picture, the, the video rights. Um, and our, our agreement with, with Mrs. Fruta was once we earned back the $150,000 in overseas, the sales to overseas magazines, then if we made any more money after that, we would split it with Mr. Zapruder. He was a hell of a businessman, among other things, and he did call me from time to time uh, to ask me how the sales were coming, whether, whether or not a check was in the mail. and. Uh, um, he, 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 he later spoke to the Warren Commission, and when I described a wounded man, he, um, he wept while he testified about what he saw that day. While you were trying to reach him on the phone, I know your memory is that uh, there was no answer at the house. Of course, there are still Zapruder family members around. Some live here in Texas and, and some are elsewhere. Their memory is a little different, that they were there. And in fact, when Mr. Z finally got home very late that night, um, he showed the film to his wife. But his daughter, uh, who was there, 
refused to watch it. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I, I had heard that, 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 that she was home when I was calling. Um, I called and nobody answered. Now, whether the wife was there or, or just the daughter or whether because of what had happened, they weren't answering the phone, I don't know. I mean, I have memories embedded about that particular night. And um, I, she, she, said, she said that to me. And uh, all I could say is, why didn't you answer the phone? <laughs> I did call uh, frequently. Maybe it wasn't every 15 minutes. Again, this has all become folklore. And uh, um, the main thing is at about 11 o'clock, he answered the phone and everything proceeded from there. Who made the decision at Time Incorporated to purchase all rights? It's never been quite clear. The, um, the film was um, hand carried to Chicago where the, the magazine was closing at the printing plant. Um, another copy went to New York and there it was shown either late Saturday night or sometime on Sunday to to all the executives at, at Time Inc. then. And um, I, I, I've been told, and I suspect it's correct, that the publisher of Life, a man named C.D. Jackson, um, who had been in CIA or OSS during the war and is part of some of the conspiracy theories, because of, of his wartime experience. I suspect he made the, the judgment that, uh, that we should get uh, not just print, but all rights, so we could, uh, partly so we could see what we might do with it, and partly, uh, and there was a very emotional factor here, partly to keep it out of the hands of people who would exploit it. Mr. Spruder was was just intense on that subject, and um, uh, and and it's it, it's hard to exploit still pictures, and a lot easier to exploit w w what you've just seen. And um, and when I called him on Sunday, uh, he seemed so relieved when he heard who it was on the phone, and I said. So, Mr. Z, we, Mr. Bruder, I wasn't, I didn't know him well enough to call him Mr. Z at that point. I said, I'd like to come and talk to you. We want to buy all rights. And the relief in his voice was absolutely palpable. And when I walked in the negotiations on Monday, I have to tell you, I walked in. And this was in his lawyer's office, not in his office. A man named Sam Passman, who I think was a pretty well-known Dallas lawyer, walked into Passman's lobby, and, and uh, who should I see over here but Dan Rather? Now, he had not gone to work for CBS. He was, he had, was doing freelance work for CBS. I knew Dan. Dan and I had, had covered racial stories in the South together. He later wrote in his book, The Camera Never Blinks. He said, the door opened and Dick Stolly walked in. My heart sank. Uh, he, he said, I knew, I knew him from racial stories. I knew life had deep pockets. And I had been authorized to pay $10,000 for video rights. And uh, he saw the film. He also either agreed verbally or signed something that unless he was able, CBS, on behalf of CBS, was able to buy the video film rights to it, he was constrained from describing the film in any way. As soon as he saw me walk in, he walked out the door, got on the phone and described the film in great detail, first on radio and then on television to CBS. Dan's a nice guy. 
but um, gives you some idea of the kind of the competitive juices that were flowing back then. Um, I won't say anything more about that. <laughs> Looking back on journalism today compared to 1963, had CBS acquired the film, do you think they would have shown it as graphic as it is? And an eye blink. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, first of all, just think. Now, how many of you are carrying cell phones? Okay. If you were in Dealey Plaza, every one of you would have caught that assassination on your, on your, on your uh, camera. I mean, there would have been not one Saputa film, there would have been 10,000 Saputa films out there. You wouldn't have had to pay that much money then, would you? <laughs> well, but, but the difference, you know, this is uh, 2011. In 1963, I mean, the, the film is so graphic, and even, in, even showing it tonight, there were gasps in this crowd from a few folks who had obviously not seen the film yet. So, but obviously after having spent that kind of money, they would have had to show it, I suppose. Well, he, there were, he was taken to Parkland Hospital, grievously wounded, huge wound in his head, and um, journalism was a little different then. There were photographers there. And I'm told the photographers got pictures of, of him being carried in, and uh, uh, they behaved out there. Um, there was a code of conduct back then that no longer exists, and um, uh, and, uh, and everyone was so stunned by what had happened that the reporters truly behaved, and photographers even more so. And they're they're an uncontrollable bunch. Um, it, it, the, that whole day was, was, was a lesson in America that no longer exists in all kinds of ways. How were you treated at Life Magazine and by Time Inc. for having acquired the film? Were, were, you, the, were you the darling boy of the year for, uh, for having done that? No. That, I don't, was, your, I, that was your job to get Well, that yeah. Person. I mean, and I, I think everybody thought, oh, wow, that's that? Yeah, that's pretty good. Now we can do for us tomorrow. I mean, it was uh, <laughs> it was it was not. We didn't realize. Well, I don't think we realized that this literally was the only. Th we knew there were a lot of photographers. I mean, this this museum unbelievably has found everybody who had a camera in Dealey Plaza that day and and have showed showed their stuff. And, and, and Abe was the only one, uh, he walked around out there to try to find a place and then he got up one of those abutments and as I said, he, he had a kind of vertigo and so he, he, he asked this the, the employee of his to stand up, you can see the picture, there, it's visible in a few pictures, you know, Abe's up there and this woman is kind of holding him by his hips behind so he doesn't, doesn't fall off. And I, like a combat cameraman, he kept that camera absolutely glued on this thing all the way through and watched the president get murdered through the rangefinder and never faltered. Car goes underneath the overpass and then, in effect, he collapses. Life magazine ran some of the stills in subsequent issues for the next several years. In 1975, you were in, I believe, your second year of People Magazine. Correct. And word spread throughout the building, I'm sure, that ABC was promoting the fact that they were going to show your film, Time Incorporated's film, uh, by a fellow named Geraldo Rivera very early in his career. Oh, here's a trivia note for you. This late night show that Geraldo hosted his announcer was shock jock Don Imus. Save that one. What happened in the office when you learned that they were going to show the film, but they did not have Time Incorporated permission? They did not. And, and what we discovered almost immediately was that people were making bootleg copies of the film. Um, there were. We sent, we sent it down to uh, 
CIA Secret Service, and we made copies. Any government agency that wanted it, we would provide one. I'm sure bootleg copies were made then, uh, and they s started being distributed around the country. Um, Jim Garrison, this lunatic DA in, in New Orleans, uh, put Clay Shaw on trial for the assassination, which some of you with, with gray in your hair may recall, um, and demanded the film. We, we sent a guy down with the film and he said, I never want that film out of my sight. And, and Garrison said, give me the film and you get out of here. And uh, I'm convinced it, it, it was duplicated uh, bootleg copies by the score down there during, during that period. Geraldo had gotten a bootleg copy um, and announced that he was going to, going to run it on ABC. In effect, daring Time Incorporated to do something about it. And um, now I was in the second year of editing People and I had a lot of other things on my mind. Uh, but um, the decision was not to try to stop him legally. Um, <clears throat> we probably could have done so, uh, but it would have given him all the kind of publicity, which is, as far as I'm concerned, what he was looking for. And um, so we finally, we just let it go. I've seen, I didn't, I, I either saw it then or saw it, it, it is about a fifth generation copy. There's almost no color in it. What's it? You know, copy after copy, it gets gets more and more faded, and it was a very faded copy he put on. But it, it was Harold who was you know, beating his chest and and saying, you know, exclusive Life magazine has been depriving him of this of of the film all these years. Now we're going to show you something they've been suppressing. Blah blah blah, and. Uh, it was, sh it was shortly after that happened that um, our company made the decision that we did not want to have to monitor the use of the film anymore. We, we were under great criticism for not giving it or, or selling it to networks. We, we never allowed that film to be shown, the video part, the motion picture part, to be shown until Geraldo did it Ill illegally, and we thought we can't we can't deal with this. So uh, only a couple of years after that, we sold it back to the uh, Sapruta family for one dollar. <coughs> then, of course, they later the federal government wanted it, and uh, I think a lot of us were talked to what was the value. The uh, Sapruta family sold it in, in effect to the federal government for 16 or 17 million. It's in that area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Million bucks. Now, had I walked out of Sapruta's plant and taken a direct, <laughs> <laughs> would anybody have paid me 16 million dollars? I don't think so. We, we were all stunned by, by, by the uh, the amount of money that the government was able to, uh, and but what the family did was give the copyright to this incredible institution here, so that you you guys now control the use of the film. The uh, the price was determined by independent arbiters, both sides, a representative of the Spruder family, uh, and, and the other, and and the government uh, turned it over to independent arbiters, who could have said, okay, it's worth a dollar. But they came up with a figure, and uh, you know, like as I explained to people, when the government takes grandma's farm so they can run a highway through there, they have to pay grandma. And that's what happened in this case. The government only purchased the film, and they did that to safeguard the film. It's stored in the National Archives in, in proper archival conditions. Yeah. But they didn't purchase the copyright. The Pruder family retained that. And to uh, support this institution, they donated the copyright to us. So the government got the film, so it can safeguard it. So the Zapruder family got out from under this uh, burden, which really was because they were in the position where the Time Incorporated was, where they had to decide, you know, who who gets what and why and under what circumstances and all. 
and we gained uh, ownership of a very, very important copyright. And when, when the museum licenses the footage for independent productions or, or whoever, uh, that money goes to support our collections and the continuing preservation uh, that we do. We have many other films and tapes and all that. So it was win, win, win for everyone. It's an amazing story and the fact that you were the one who purchased the film all those years ago and you wind up here at the Sixth Floor Museum, the owner of the film's copyright and the, essentially the image is, is an incredible journey <laughs> and much of it is in uh, Roger's excellent film. Um, wh when I do an internet search under Richard Stolley or Dick Stolley, your name pops up with People Magazine and the many other uh, successes you've had in your career, but it pops up the same number of times with the Zapruder film. Are you good with that? <laughs> Every journalist writes his own obituary. And it seems clear to me that my obituary is going to have two things in the lead. That I founded People Magazine and I got the Subruder film. I will tell you, I'm perfectly happy with that. <laughs>